All right, Father, we thank you tonight for worship. What a good time it is to worship you, Lord, to get away from the, the work, the busyness, the, the schedules, the responsibilities, to just sit at your feet, worship at our, our Lord for who he is and, and, and who we know him to be, wanting to know you all the more. So may you bless our time now, Lord, as we open your word, speak to us clearly through it. May we realize that, Lord, you've honored your word above even your name because it is your word that you have given us to know you by and to follow you with. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's open our Bibles to tonight. Uh, we're continuing through the book of Acts, chapter 18, verse 1. And I think we have the map up here. We, we have all of these maps, first, second, third trips of uh, Paul in his missionary journeys, also his trip to Rome, which we'll get later on in the book. If you don't have one, stop by the counter on the way out or ask one of the ushers, they'll get you one. Acts is a, is a written narrative, reported, reported, <laughs> Okay. Reported through the ministry of Dr. Luke, who the Holy Spirit moved upon to write. It is a, it is a narrative of the first 30 years of the history of the church, the expansion, the, 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 the growth. Its primary focus is upon the work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of born-again believers and how God provided not only power to their lives, but passion and drive and love for the lost. It is a book that because it is so close to the, the, the nexus of the, of the church, will tell us what kind of church the Lord would have us to be, what kind of believers he would like to use. And so uh, the gospel was first carried to the Jews, and, and, and really the first 15 years of this 30-year narrative is, is, covers that more than anything else. God's desire to reach all men, though, through the gospels, through his son, was revealed very clearly um, when the Lord sent Peter miraculously to the house of Cornelius the centurion where Peter shared the gospel in, in its simplest form and the whole household was, was turned to Christ and filled with the spirit and, and, and it became very clear very quickly that uh, the Lord wanted to save all men through the gospel. At the same time that was going on with Peter um, in Caesarea there were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who had cle cleared out really uh, from Jerusalem because Stephen had been put to death. Uh, they traveled 300 miles north to Antioch in Syria. You can see there on, on the map. It is, it is the place from which the church would go forward into all of the world to preach the gospel. And it is really the center of the last 15 chapters of the book of Acts in the sense that God wanted the message to go to all men. These men that went to Antioch preached to the Hellenists. They were uh, Jews for the most part that practiced kind of Greek or Roman, you know, tendencies. They weren't, they weren't as religious in their practices as the people in Jerusalem might have been. And again, the gospel was, was there saving many. In fact, the, the, the big conflict early on in, in, the, in, the book, in the book is the conflict between the Jewish mind, God's chosen us as his people, and then seeing Gentiles get saved without becoming Jews. And how is that possible? I thought we were the chosen people of God. And it was a stumbling block. It took a long time for people to embrace it. You can watch very carefully Peter having to learn that as well as others. Uh, some there in Jerusalem didn't embrace that so quickly. Barnabas, a guy that certainly didn't mind at all, was sent by the Jerusalem church 300 miles north to Antioch. See what was going on. He ministered. People got saved by the droves. He realized he couldn't handle the, the teaching aspect. That wasn't his call, gift. He, he went to find Saul who had been really out of the limelight and really away maybe 10 years or more where we didn't even know where he might have been. He was in Tarsus and in those surrounding areas. He agreed to come to Antioch. He began to teach. They were there for a year. And then as this body began to thrive, their, their vision was the mission field, the world. And they wanted to take the gospel to the world. And so Paul takes three extended trips into the mission field with ever-increasing kind of circles. And that is the bulk or the, or the majority, I should say, of the, the last half of the book of Acts. And it is, it is an amazing story of the grace of God and the power of God and, and the goodness of God to save. At every step, Paul met the Judaizers. The Judaizers were those who will not accept that Gentiles could come in at all. And many of them even rejected Christ. But they followed Paul wherever he went. They were a thorn in his side. They were... 
They were, the, the greatest difficulty for him didn't come from the world, it came from, from religious folks. And, but, but Paul continued on, uh, for 46, 47 AB, AD, um, first missionary journey, two years, most of it in Galatia area to the north, um, 50 to 55 AD, six years or so. The second journey, all of these journeys, Paul went back to where he began and, and strengthened what was were ha- happening before uh, going somewhere else. In the second journey, he spent most of his time in Europe. In the third and final journey that Paul took, pretty soon after the second one ended, from 55 or so to 57 AD, um, Paul would end up, for, mo- for the most of the part, in, in Ephesus. That was uh, the majority of his time was spent planning the church at Ephesus. So 1,200 miles in the first trip, 2,700 miles in the second, 2,500 in the third, and then we still got to get Paul to Jerusalem and off to prison in Rome before we finish the book. So a lot to look up and, and to, uh, to learn. Paul went on his first journey with uh, Barnabas. He went on his second journey with uh, Silas and Timothy and and others. Um, Luke joined them as well in Troas, there on the coast, would be left in Philippi. And then um, on the third journey, Silas just disappears in chapter 18. We, we don't hear from him anymore. We don't know what happened. We don't get much explanation. We can presume some things, but that's not a good way to study. So we'll just say he just isn't seem to be around on that third trip. And we'll find five or six names of people who were with Paul on that third missionary journey, uh, spending a lot of time in Ephesus. So we are in the second journey. So if, you, if, you, if you're new here, you can go to the archives and listen to all of the studies, catch up, do them all in one week, that'd be good. There's a lot of them since we're in chapter 18. But, but on the second journey, and it's the longest journey, six years worth, Paul and Silas go back to Galatia, to all of the churches. Galatia is to date almost all Turkey. Um, through trial and error, they figured out over maybe weeks or months that the Lord wanted them to go to Europe. They, they figured that out because they, they went as far as they could and they, they finally ran into the Aegean Sea. They're at Troas on the map. And then God called them over to Philippi. We are given in chapter 16 three prominent people that got saved in Philippi, the ministry that began there, a, a Jewish wealthy, wealthy Jewish businesswoman and her household, a demon-possessed girl delivered from these demons, that, how she had been used by others, and then a jailer and his family. Paul and Silas are arrested uh, upon the complaint of that woman being delivered of a demon, and they were beaten and thrown in prison. It led to the conversion, obviously, of the jailer. When they found out Paul was a Roman and they shouldn't have beat him, they, they gave him a lot of grace, and Paul gave them a lot. He said that he was leaving, but you know, there, he knew what they had done, and, and I think he bought the church some time. When that happened, Paul and the boys left. Like I said, they left uh, Dr. Luke uh, there. They would pick him up again um, on the third missionary journey through a couple of years later, but, but, but Luke stays in Philippi, first ministry place in Europe. They go 105 miles or so uh, to Thessalonica through a place called Amphipolis, through a place called Apollonia. They're about 30, 35 miles each on the road. And they they were only there for three weeks. They went to the synagogues. They shared uh, the gospel. They were very bold and outspoken. A riot erupted. It it was led by religious unbelievers. And the, the team had to go down the road for their own safety. They traveled 50 miles or so to Berea where they found just the opposite. People that were willing to listen to the gospel, folks that were, were, were temperate in their, you know, their response, they were, they were studious, they were hungry. They wouldn't just buy what you told them, but they'd be willing to listen and be convinced. And, and Paul found great uh, fruit there, and, and I think a lot of satisfaction. We don't know how long he stayed there, we are not told. But eventually the people from Thessalonica came there and they began to cause the same problems that they had in Thessalonica. Um, And so the church, or the believers that were there at the time, they thought it was best to get rid of Paul. Let's send Paul 20 miles down to the coast, let's put him on a boat, and Paul would travel 250 miles across the Aegean uh, there to uh, Athens. He would send back word to his two buddies that he left behind, uh, to Silas, 
and to Timothy, please come as soon as you can. And he left them there to continue to minister to the young church in Berea, which left Paul for months alone. We, we looked at his ministry in Athens. You remember the story of him meeting the intellectuals and the philosophers up on Mars Hill. Um, but he left that place with very little fruit, very little satisfaction, and, and pretty frustrated that every place he goes, he's beat up and left for dead. And if, they're not, you know, if, they, if he's doing well, then someone finds him, and then the trouble starts all over again. And so he decides he's not going to stay in Athens. He's going to travel 50 more miles. You can see it on your map to Corinth which is where we join Paul tonight. He is discouraged. He is at his wit's end. He's by himself. That's not easy. And he needs some encouragement. But Corinth is the, the filthiest place on the planet. And so if Paul thought Athens was bad, boy, this place was worse. Spurgeon wrote on his notes on Acts 18, through perseverance, the snail made it to the ark. And I thought that was a good quote. I, I heard a great quote last week. It has nothing to do with this study, but I got to tell you because I liked it. The guy was talking about, you know, fighting for what you want and what you need and what's right with the Lord. And he said, you should fight like the third monkey at the door of the ark and it's starting to rain. <laughs> and I thought, that's great. The third monkey. That means he's got to get one of the two there off so he can stay. Yeah, it has nothing to do with this study, but I, 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 I share whatever I, I, I can. Nehemiah found halfway home discouraging. Maybe you do as well. We've been at this building thing with the, with the drawings and all of the city for almost two years. It can be discouraging. But, you know, we also believe God is in charge. So every time you get discouraged, if you're going to complain, you've got to complain against God's oversight, and you can't do that. So here's, here's Paul. He is called to, to persevere. His work is great. It is hardly ever easy in the Bible. Ultimately, it's God's work in us. If the lesson of the first 18 verses of chapter 18 had to be summarized, I would say that you should write across it, it's too soon to quit. I don't know what you're doing and what God's called you to, but don't give up now because there is much to be done. So we're going to look at the first 13 verses of chapter 18. I'm going to continue to try to do summaries until we get to the end of the book, but I think I'm going to fall apart at some point. Verse 1. After these things, that was Paul's time in Athens, he departed from Athens and he went to Corinth and he found a certain Jew there named Achilla, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews should depart from Rome. And so he came to them and he, he, and he came because he saw this, that they were in the same trade and he stayed with them and he worked with them for they were occupied as tent makers. Corinth is, is one of the most decadent places in the first century that you will find. I'm sure that Paul pulled in here on the boat and went, wondered if he arrived at the wrong planet. It, is, it was the political capital for years of Greece. Greece it was destroyed in 146 BC by the Romans because they said the Greeks were rebel, rebelling. It was rebuilt in 46 AD by Julius Caesar. It is a unique place. We were there on the footsteps tour with our church last year. It has ports on both sides of the landmass. So uh, there, there's a, a west and an east side. It was the chief stop between Asia and Italy uh, for those trade routes. It, it was a town in the first century of three quarters of a million people. That's huge in, in first century terms. Uh, this, it was a sailor's port. It was known as the Vanity Fair of the Roman Empire. There was no Roman town in the empire that came close to the perversion and the wickedness that you'd find in Corinth. What happened in Corinth stayed in Corinth. On the Agro-Corinth hill, there stood a, a temple to uh, Venus. Venus is called in Greek Aphrodite. She is called Ashtaroth to the Phoenicians, it's the same goddess. She was the goddess of sexuality. And every night, these thousands of prostitutes would come down from the temple into the city to lure men and women into worship of this pagan god in a very perverse manner. It was so bad that in the vernacular, to Corinthianize meant to commit adultery or to fornicate. 
It's what the word means. The town named a sin. If you want to get a feel for what Paul saw when he landed, and we know kind of his mindset and how long he'd been on his own, read Romans chapter 1. Because Paul will write that book from here. And seeing the plethora of idolatry and, and the perversion of worship, um, it was more than Paul could handle. When later Paul wrote to the church here, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, let me read to you what he wrote in his first letter to the church that obviously doesn't exist yet because he's just arriving. But he wrote this, Brethren, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellence of speech, or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, I determined that I wouldn't know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, with much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but they were in the demonstration of God's power and of his spirit, that your faith could not be or should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So Paul left Athens where he tried to argue on an intellectual basis. Well, your own prophets have written and he went, that's ah, not working. I got to go back to preaching Jesus. That's all I'm going to do. And that's what he determined when he came here. That's the way he was going to go about it. That's where, the place he was going to stay. So Paul was in trembling, in fear. He was broken. He was discouraged. He was certainly at the end of his rope. The, the road had been tough. The stays had been short. The response had been uneven. They were lonely, or he was lonely, certainly, and it made it all the worse. The rabbis used to teach their students in Judaism that every good rabbi should have a trade to fall back on. Paul was a tent maker. He would wave goat's hairs together to make fabrics for tents. In fact, when we were in Ephesus... Uh, and also in Corinth, we were shown places where the, in the markets the merchants would, would set up shop in, in the ruins. It's quite possible that we looked right into one of the places that Paul very much might have been working when he came to town. So he joins as he comes to town and looks for work two Jewish believers who hire him and give him a place to live. We are told in Romans 16, again, this book written from here, Paul and the, the, the letter to the Romans, because that's where these folks will end up, say hello or greet Priscilla and Achilla, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their own necks for my life. Not only do I give them thanks, but so do all of the churches of the Gentiles. So they established some really good rapport, good relationship. There was, there was a, you know, a man and a wife who who gave themselves over, if you will, to, to helping and supporting Paul. They would later go with Paul to Ephesus. They would host a church there in their own home. They would end up with the Romans. So uh, we can't follow them completely, but we know a lot about them from what the scriptures have to say. We, we are told, notice in verse 2 here, that they had come here to Corinth because in Rome, Emperor Claudius, he came to power in 49 A.D., gave an edict that all of the, the Jews would leave Rome completely. And for many years, the Jews were not allowed to live in Rome. Achilla was from Pontus, we are told. That's a Roman province on the, on the Black Sea. But he came here to start a, a new business. He was a believer. So was his wife. You need Christian businessmen. And he was one who put Jesus first. So he and Paul and his wife would, would work, or he and his wife and Paul would, would work together every day, and uh, they would spend their time just making tents, but yet, you know, being a witness on the job. Sometimes people wonder, well, maybe I should be in full-time ministry. Well, you are. No matter where you go to work, you're in full-time ministry. You know that. Uh, we, we hire pastors here and others when the work is such that you really don't have time to do it well unless you can devote all of your time to it. But, you know, most churches, when they start, and there, there's a lot of, of, of things to be said for bivocational ministry until you get started, and, and we find Paul doing that a lot. He's, he certainly didn't want to be a burden to anyone. So he was, he was interested in serving, but he wanted very much to, to, you know, get the word out. That was more important to him than anything else. Um, it wasn't an easy life. Paul worked his tail off. I can't imagine... Uh, the hours that he kept. But if you love the body and you want to be a shepherd and, and, and serve others, Paul 
a pretty good example of that. And he oftentimes, like I said, supported himself. Now, he wasn't against being supported. In fact, you can read in, in Galatians chapter 6 that he said, if, it, it, let him who teaches the word in all good things share with him who is teaching. So he, he talks a lot about the support of the church. You know, Jesus said, stay in that house, eat and drink there as they give you the a, a laborers worthy of his hire. Just don't run from house to house. Uh, Paul said to the Th Thessalonians, where he was only at for three weeks, he said, uh, you remember how I labored amongst you day and night. I don't want to be a burden to any of you while I preach to you the, uh, the gospel of God. I just want to tell you the gospel. I don't want to be a, a, a burden. In fact, you might read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, which is a really succinct kind of a chapter about finances and the church and the laborer and, and uh, you know, the muzzling of the ox who treads out the grain. It's, it's really good. And it, it'll give you Paul's heart on, on how he viewed this. But for, at least for now, he went to work and he sought to work. His concern was not himself as much as the people that, that God loved. But remember, Paul was really out, right? He worked every day on Saturdays, though. He went to the synagogue. He went to minister to the people, and especially the Jews first, was kind of his practice, um, to reach out to them. We, we read in verse 4, uh, so he worked in verse 3 with the tent makers, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, seeking to persuade both Jews and Greeks. To reason is the word dialogue. It means to dispute with a purpose or to, to challenge people's positions, having an answer for them. The word persuade in Greek means to prove. So he, he sought to, to provide both Jew and Gentile converts to Judaism a, a foundation for them believing in Christ. This wasn't a one-time message where you're going to all get saved. This was more like, I got to know you and you get to know me and let's talk about it and, and work through your questions and, until you come to where you believe in, in, in the Jesus that I know. And, and Paul took a very, I, I want to say, not a backseat approach, but I'll say that he took it very slowly. It, it could perhaps be, and I, I say it only because of what we read in the next couple of verses, that Paul was not willing to push anybody's buttons at this point to cause a fight. He'd been beat up so much and left alone for so long that he just figured he'd be as mellow as he could because we're going to read in verse 5 that when his buddies finally do come to Corinth, Paul changes back to the old Paul, the in-your-face preaching to you until you won't listen anymore, Paul. That was his method. But at least here in verse 4, you know, maybe he challenged them to study the, you know, the prophecies of the Messiah, but he wasn't confrontation. No, he sat back, it seems. He was able to go there every Sabbath. He didn't shut the door on himself. Uh, it is not the usual Paul, but it seemed to work for, in some matter in the sense that he got to come back. I think if you, you, know, you go to work and you preach to someone and you get in their face, um, it might be your only conversation with them. If you can kind of challenge them in their beliefs, you might have lots of them and, and bring them along. So I'm not saying one's better than the other, but the Lord certainly should lead you. And, and it seemed like Paul for a while here just kind of put the brakes on. In verse 5, though, we, say, we read, When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the spirits. He stirred in his heart, and he began to testify to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. When, when the group came from Thessalonica, um, and again, we have, we have letters that Paul wrote. Paul wrote in chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians this about these men's arrival. And now that Timothy has come to us from you, and that he has brought good news of your faith and love, and that you've always had a good remembrance of us, and that you greatly desire to see us as we do you as well. Brethren, in all of our afflictions and in all of our distresses, we are comforted concerning you by your faith. And now we live if we know that you'll stand in the Lord. That was Paul's heart. Man, we're going through it, but the, just the good news that the church is doing well is all that matters to me. I can handle anything if I know that there's fruit that will last. And so Timothy brought good news to Paul. Um, we are told in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, this is the, the, the church that's being planted, that, that Paul said to them, uh, when I was with you, I didn't want to be a burden to you. Remember, he worked as a tent maker. Uh, but what I lacked, the brethren from Macedonia supplied. 
So it does seem like, like Paul, uh, his friends Timothy and Silas, came get, bearing some financial help for Paul. And it could very well be, although we can't be certain, that it gave Paul the opportunity to, to make less tents and preach a little longer. Because we find him eventually being able to set up uh, at a home and, and, and seem to do more regular teaching than he might have done just that once uh, on a Saturday. Uh, but he mentions that, that devotion. So their arrival gave Paul a, a huge boost, compelled in the spirit. Consumed is the word, right? Held to one concern. He's like an inflated balloon. He, he wanted to share. I, I think that if you are prone to be a little hesitant in ministry, you're not good at speaking up and, and it makes you uncomfortable, you're not sure you're going to be able to answer the question someone asks, hang around with somebody that does. Go together. <laughs> There's something about ministry together. Uh, it, it works in a bad sense when a bunch of people get together to do the wrong thing, but it works in a good sense as well. And so it certainly did help Paul. Notice in verse 5 here that he comes more forcefully to the, the synagogue. Now he, he clearly testifies, tells it out loud. Jesus, he's the Messiah. He might have been beaten around the bush before, but he's not doing that anymore. Um, verse 6 tells us, when they opposed him and, and they blasphemed, he shook his garments. He said to them, your blood can be upon your own heads. I am clean and from now on, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. The reaction to Paul's boldness was swift. It was blasphemous. Uh, they opposed themselves. In fact, verse 6, it, it talks about opposed him, but it's in the middle voice. So it literally means in opposing him, they opposed themselves. A middle voice reflects the, the words that you're speaking in Greek. So they're, they're opposing Paul, but, but really the Lord says, in not listening to the good news, they're, they're, they're their own worst enemy, if you will. Paul said the same thing, I think, in that second Timothy chapter 2 letter where where he said to Timothy, avoid the foolish questions of men and all. Be temperate. Don't strive. You know, maybe God will give them repentance to, to, to know the truth and they'll, be, they'll brought, be brought to their senses and they'll escape the, the snare of the, the, the devil who's taken them captive at their own will. Paul gave them the same advice. Just, you got to kind of be, you know, ready to give answers. But, but notice his reaction. I think, I think with, with what happened in Thessalonica, what happened in Berea, what happened in Athens, and now in Corinth, that Paul had had enough. You know, they'd been given opportunities time and again to believe, and Paul just figures, I can't do it. And he, and he shakes his, his garment out, and he says, your blood be upon your own head. The words out of Ezekiel, the prophet, means you're responsible for your own destiny, right? You're responsible for what you know. It's a phrase that the spies use with Rahab, you might remember. Well, they said, if you'll do these things and tie this out the window, then you'll be fine. And, and whoever's in their house with you, you'll be saved. But if you don't do it, then your blood be upon your own head. That's going to be your responsibility. So Paul had had it. He just figured this wasn't a place to be. He loved the people. He was one of them. But he knew that his calling was ultimately to the Gentiles. And so you're going to have to answer for it. He was frustrated. <laughs> and he was tired of the opposition, I think, more than anything else. Which brings us to verse 7 where we read, He departed from there, and he entered the house of a certain man named Justice. He was a man who worshipped God, and his house happened to be next door to the synagogue. Oh, that's helpful. And Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, he believed on the Lord with all of his household, as well as many of the Corinthians. When they heard, they believed, and they were baptized. So Paul, Paul moves next door to Justice's home. Not exactly a way to avoid conflict. Um, I may have told you the story before, but when we were in Holland a few years ago, um, the Church of Satan was the largest church downtown. It had more practicing, I don't know what you call them, Satanists than everybody else. So Youth with a Mission got the good idea to plant a coffee shop next door to the place. So when these folks would come out of their church services, they would come in and get coffees, and they'd have all their folks sitting around sharing. They stayed there for three years. In three years, the Church of Satan closed in Amsterdam. Closed. Because everyone either got saved or just left. And the Lord used them to plant them next door. And I remember talking to the fella who had come to that idea. And he was so excited that the Lord had used them. Just in friendship kind of evangelism over a cup of coffee. So um, 
Paul moved next door. He, he would write to the Romans, and again, from the city. He would write, if there are any means I could use to provoke my own people, my flesh and blood, that some of them could be saved, I would do that. I, would just want, I want to provoke them to listen and believe. Well, he did. He moved right next door to the synagogue. They would go in, and then he'd be next door having Bible studies. A pretty interesting setup. Pretty bold uh, of Paul, certainly. And uh, J- Justin's family name might have been, uh, if you're taking notes, uh, might have been Gaius. In Romans chapter 16, um, verse 23, Paul will write, Gaius is my host and the host of the whole church here, and he greets you. So it could very well be that, that Paul um, met in Justin's home, and that would have then have been his family name, and, and you can kind of keep that in the back of your mind. If that's so, it is also one of the only names that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 as having baptized that family. So the connections are all there in the letters, certainly. Um, in any event, God began to move in very unmistakable ways. Notice in verse 8 that, that the, the result was even the, the, the rabbi next door got saved. So did his family. And then the Corinthians began to come and listen and believe. And, and they had baptisms. And, and uh, there were very few people baptized by Paul. But there was a lot of stir going on. <laughs> and I don't doubt that Paul wondered if, man, what's the next problem here? Notice that many of the Corinthians, the fornicators, the, the perverse in the town, they heard about Jesus and they came and were baptized. And I, I should just point out to you, since we're going through it, Paul didn't baptize many folks because, for one thing, it became a status symbol. Who's been, have you been baptized by Paul or not? Second of all, he didn't believe it was a part of the gospel. In fact, he said very clearly in his First Corinthians letter, God didn't call me to baptize, he called me to preach the gospel. Everywhere in the Bible, baptism for the believer is an after, uh, uh, obedient after uh, event, obedience to the word of God. So, you know, there are people that will teach you have to be baptized to be saved. They have not bothered to read their Bibles. Paul categorized them as, as part, or, or categorized baptism as part of church life. Um, and separated the gospel from it. So I believe if Paul truly believed you had to be baptized to be saved, you will not read in 1 Corinthians 14, oh, I baptized this guy and that guy and everybody else. I don't even know who they were. I think he'd have been baptizing 24 hours a day because that's where his heart was, was to see people get saved. So get yourself situated here. There's a synagogue next door. Every week they, the church next door is growing while the synagogue seems to be shrinking. The prostitutes are coming. The affluent are coming. The religious idolaters are coming. Jewish leaders are coming. Their initial response might have been anger, but you know how that goes. It won't be long before disdain becomes violent. Paul had had that every place he had stopped. And so I think it was heavy on Paul's heart as they began to grow again to go, oh man, I'm going to get whooped here pretty soon. I, I, you know, he's probably ducking at shadows yet. Every knock at the door is a mob about to drag him out of town and kill him. Because that's all he knows. And that, that, that first loneliness and dis- discouragement, now blessing and fear. Which is why we read in verse 9, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night in a vision. Do not be afraid. Speak, do not, or do not keep silent. I'm with you. No one will attack you or hurt you. I have many people in this city. And he continued there for 18 months teaching the word of God among them. One night, the Lord gave Paul a vision. It was perfectly timed. It was greatly needed. This won't be the last time Jesus comes to talk to Paul. He'll have a meeting with him in uh, Acts 23 in Jerusalem in Acts 27, on a boat on the way to Rome. But, but you, can always, you can always tell what the Lord is dealing with by what he says. He says to Paul, first thing, don't be afraid. What, what would that tell you? That Paul was afraid, right? That he was worried about what was coming next. In fact, he wrote that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. We were with you in much trembling and fear. He was. As revival began, I think Paul recalled Lystra and Philippi and others and, you know, there'd been some gains, but at great personal expense. If you ever read the, the, the gospel and think of Paul as a super saint, I would tell you he's not. 
He hurt like you do. <laughs> he struggled like we do. He, he, he was fearful and, you know, he, he'd flinch too once he got hit a few times and so would you. But he's a brave guy and he's looking for a revival. He loves it and hates it all at the same time, if that makes any sense. He couldn't be happier with all the people that are coming. He's totally fearful that that's going to bring with him another round of, of tremendous suffering. And yet, he needed to hear from Jesus. And Jesus came and said to him, don't be afraid. Why not? A, I'm with you. The surest defense against fear is the awareness of the presence of God. If the Lord is with you, what do you have to fear? When I was a little kid and I'd go places with my dad even in the dark, I wasn't afraid. If my dad wasn't there, I'd be afraid in the, cl the closet in my bedroom. What's in there? It's noisy. Probably a monster. When dad was around, I'd go right to sleep. I didn't care. Dad would have to deal with the monster. Same thing with this, right? The presence of God. David learned it fairly quickly. You know, he was, he was able to say, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because you are with me. Know that tonight. The Lord is with you. Paul would write as he learned that lesson, again to the Romans, which he wrote from Corinth, um, if God be for us, who could be against us? That was, he learned that here in Corinth. If God is with us, who can be against us? So, I'm with you. No one will hurt you. God promises Paul divine protection in this city. Now, he didn't promise him that in every city, as we are well aware of. Sometimes God brings you through the trials. Sometimes he delivers you from them. Now, I would just vote, I want to be delivered from all of them. I don't want to go through any of them. I don't want rain. Oh, I've seen the dark night. No, I don't need any of that. I want sunshine and downhill and wind at my back and blessing. <laughs> it doesn't always happen that way. But at least in this case, for this year and a half, Paul had a word from the Lord that things were going to go well. And, and Paul might have been getting paranoid or timid. Paul, don't be afraid. Second of all, speak up, man. Tell everyone. I know that you're going to see what you're doing. Just tell everyone. I'll protect you. Shoot, shoot off your mouth. I'll, I'll take care of you. Pretty cool word of prophecy. And then he says this to him, I have much people in this city. I just love, I, I underline it in my Bible every time I see it, my, I keep underlining. I have many people in this city. I love the fact that the Lord is able to look at Corinth, a bunch of unsaved perverts, and say of them, they're mine. I'm coming after them. That God saw the city far differently than Paul would have with his own two eyes. Those people that night sat in the bars, were with the prostitutes on the hill, were out partying and struggling and straying. The Lord saw them as his own. Paul would write to Timothy in his second letter, to the last letter to Timothy in chapter two. This is one thing that you can know. This is the, the solid foundation upon which God stands. The Lord knows those who are his. God has an eye on those that are gonna come. That, that's where his heart is. I, I've chosen you in him before the foundation of the world. That's what Paul would write to the Ephesians. So Paul was given an assurance by the Lord that there was much work to be done. Athens, the place he came from, was, was pretty poor soil. The intellectuals were there. But here in the filth capital of the world, there were hungry, lonely, disillusioned by the worldly pleasure. They were lost. Um, how do you suppose God will reach our city through you and I? The gangs, the drugs, the punks, just the criminals. Do you see them when you go to the store as future children of God? You go, ah, oh, that guy could be saved. Or do you go, ah, oh, get away from that guy, he's scary. Do, or should they, should they be avoided? Or should we, we, we reach out? I believe that God has lots of people in the city that want to be saved. And I think the Lord would say to you and I, go speak, don't be silent. I have a lot of people I want to reach. And, and, and for better or worse, his chosen method of reaching them is you and I. And you might say to yourself, oh man, I wish it wasn't me. But how are they going to believe on him when they, you know, how are they going to call upon him when they have not believed in? How are they going to believe in him 
whom they have not heard of. And how are they going to hear unless there comes a preacher? And, and how will they preach unless they are sent? How beautiful are on the mountain are the feet of those who bring the good news of peace. That's in the, the Romans letter too. <laughs> and Paul wrote that from here as well. He learned a lot here. Uh, things that, that, that gripped his heart at a time when he, he was open to hear whatever God had to say. So rather than looking around seeing all the failures of men and the sinfulness of men, and Paul could have looked out the window and go, man, this is a gross town. He looked out and went, these are people God wants to reach. And, and he put himself in that position to do it. I'll say this to you. You will never know what God can do with you until you open up your mouth and share God's word with someone. It'll blow your mind what he'll do <laughs> and how people get saved. It's just ridiculous. You got saved in that five-minute conversation? I, now I see the light. And you'll be high-fiving Jesus all the way home. Verse 11 says, For 18 months, Paul was here teaching the word of God. He was encouraged, invigorated. He was, he was, he was on fire. <laughs> he was strengthened. God's way to reach a city that is lost is through the teaching and through the preaching of his word. These Gentiles, for the most part, had no biblical background whatsoever. They were absolutely idolaters. They knew nothing else. And yet, how do they get reached? The ultimate new believer class, just teach the Bible. It works. It works. With just a word from the Lord, Paul presses on with great confidence, even doing what he had not done up to this point. He stayed in one place for a year and a half. That was unheard of. All because he'd heard from Jesus and was willing to do the work. I like that there's a, there, uh, there's a uh, scripture in Isaiah chapter 7 where King Ahaz is being threatened by an invasion. And the Lord comes to King Ahaz and he said, look, if you'll trust me, I'll tell you one thing. Their plans will not stand and their counsel will not come to pass. That was all he said to him. You just trust me. Whatever they're up to, it's not going to work. And fortunately, Ahaz... Uh, Unfortunately, I should say, Ahaz turned away in fear, but the Lord protected them by his word anyway. Our response to the promises of God have no effect on the outcome of the battle. Let me say that again. Our response to the, to the promises of God have no effect on the outcome of the battle. But it'll have a great effect on whether you become a vessel through whom God can work or not. Notice in verse 11, 18 months in Corinth. L write this down or, or try to remember. In those 18 months, Paul wrote from here two letters to the Thessalonians, a letter to the Romans, where there was already a church established, a letter to the Hebrews, and then soon after this, First and Second Corinthians, which you may want to go read in light of what you have read here tonight so you know a little bit about it. That'll be your extra credit. Turn in your homework before the thirty, and we'll give you stars. So all of that coming from this time, 18 months, right? Two Thessalonian letters, Romans, Hebrews, and then as soon as he leaves, two letters to the Corinthians as well, and they needed it. Well, one little section to go before we call it a night, verse 12. When Galigo, Galio, Galio was made the proconsul or the governor of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul to bring him to the seat of judgment. And they said, this fellow is persuading men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth to speak, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wickedness, O Jews, there would be reason that I would bear with you. But if it's a question of words and names and your own law, then you look to it yourself, for I will not be a judge to you in such manners. And he drove them from the judgment seat and then all of the Jews, uh, Greeks, not the Jews, but the Greeks, took Sosthenes, who was the ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him before the judgment seat, but Galileo took no notice of that at all. Galileo comes to power while Paul is here for 18 months. Remember, God had said, no one's going to hurt you. Galileo, or Gallio, had great connections in Rome. He was the brother of Seneca, if you know anything about Greek history. He was Nero's uh, teacher, a tutor. Galileo was put in charge of Achaia in 51 AD as proconsul, according to history. 
His appointment prompted the Jews who already hated Paul to try to make a political and kind of, you know, corporate move against him by going after a new governor who wanted to put his foot, that's what, forward, and complain immediately about Paul. And they, they wanted to take legal action to stop the spread of Christianity. They hoped a new governor would act quickly and decisively to make a good impression on Rome. However, from what we read, they calculated wrong. Because notice, when Paul was about to speak for himself, he'd been in this position before, the Lord moved upon this pro council's heart in such a way that Paul didn't have to say a thing. Remember what the Lord said? I've got your back. <laughs> no one's going to hurt you here. So when he began to speak, and said Galileo, he spoke up. I love how God's in charge. I, Paul, just sit back and watch this. Galileo, or Galileo, whatever his name is, saw this action as Jewish jealousy, internal dispute, and he threw it out of court. The Greeks, seeing how they tried to be, these Jews, turn against others, and especially the believing Greeks, uh, the Greeks came and they lashed out at the Jews with their own brand of wickedness. They, emboldened by the court, they rioted, took this, this rabbi from the, who had replaced Crispus, apparently, as the ruler, and they beat him, and the courts didn't do anything about it. It's kind of like, yeah, you guys are on your own. Now, it could be this fellow Sosthenes that was beaten later comes around, because we do have at least one place, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, again written to this church, where Paul greets Sosthenes, our brother in the Lord. I don't know if it was a common name or not, but there was at least one guy that we can trace from here to 1 Corinthians where Paul opens his letter to them and says, hey, our brother says hello to you. So he maybe got beat right into the kingdom. I don't know. <laughs> of the 18 months that Paul was here, this incident seems to have taken place in the first eight months or so. Paul stayed another year here, this time a Roman ruler protecting him. By the way, just as a side note, in the book of Acts, you will never see the Roman government persecuting the church, ever. There is no persecution from the Roman government. Sometimes they, they vindicate you as they did here, as they did in Philippi, and as they will later on in Ephesus. The Romans tend to, to protect the church much more so than the religious folks around them. So we conclude tonight, we, we see a, a glorious work in, in Corinth. Paul is back on track, Paul is refreshed, he is encouraged. He's determined to do what God has said. He's aware of God's presence. Um, and I guess that's how you should leave church. Be encouraged. Be, be encouraged by the fact that, that even when the laborers are few, when there's hardships, that nothing spiritually accomplishes. You don't find much of it in the Bible as an easy work. But God is with you as he was with Paul. If he is for you, who can be against you? Amen? Next week, we will take the road with Paul to Ephesus. We're going to end the second missionary journey of Paul next week and immediately begin the third missionary journey, all in three verses. No, we'll go to the end of the chapter at least. Father, we thank you tonight as we sit together for your word to us and how good it is for us to, to stop and consider uh, your word and the things that you tell us in this narrative as we, we start with Paul alone in a big city. He doesn't know what will come next. That things haven't gone well for him. He is discouraged and upset. He is withdrawing and, and back to work and toning down his rhetoric. And even his zeal seems to have momentarily been kind of laid aside. He's taking a different tack. He's going to just use God's word. He's not going to push the buttons much until his friend shows up and then he's back to the old guy who loves the Lord with great zeal. And Lord, that you might teach us that it is not a good day to give up on our walks with you, not a good day to, to give up on our ministry hopes, not a good day to, to, to give up on the prayers we've been praying that are not being answered. It is not a good time for us to turn away or turn around or walk away. Lord, there's work to be done. It isn't, the work that we read in the book of Acts, though it is dynamic, was never done in, in a set setting of, of ease and, and peace, but for the most part in, ten, in a setting of, of great resistance and, and, and difficulty. So may you encourage us, all of us tonight, to be about our Father's business, 
to, to love the lost, to preach his word, to be confident in the work of your spirit and your divine protection and divine leading that we might accomplish, that, that you have much people in this city, in these cities around us. May we go to all of them and invite them to come in. And may that be your prayer tonight, that God would use you every week to bring someone with you to church, to sit down and, and talk to someone, not just send them here so that we would talk to them, and we'll do that. But that you might say to them, hey, where are you at with God? What do you believe about him? Where does your peace and hope come from? Men are, are hungry to know. The fields are white. Just be a laborer this week. Let's see what God will do with you. You need prayer tonight, we'll be happy to pray with you. You need to, need to meet Jesus tonight. You come and tell one of the pastors and they'll pray with you too. It's gonna to be a good week as we let Jesus lead us and guide us in this ministry that he's given to us in the city. Shall we stand together?